Good. Um, okay, well, now the official start. Sorry. That's okay. We're going to wind back the, the clock the last <laughs> few minutes. never happened. Um, welcome to Making Meetup Magic, Growing the OpenStack Community Through Meetups. Uh, welcome to Barcelona. For those of you who have traveled far, I think as most of us have. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction and we're going to just dive right in. Um, my name is Gary Kevorkian. I, am the, uh, I run the OpenStack LA meetup group. And you would and like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Tisuluka Koris from IBM and I run the Seattle meetup. I'm Lisa Marie Amphi and I run the San Francisco Bay Area user group meetup. User group meeting. Well, we'll talk about that yes. in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. uh, my name is Ken Hoyt. I work at Rackspace and I am the co organizer for uh, the New York and Philadelphia user groups. And I'm also an OpenStack ambassador for Foundation. Very, very impressive okay. credentials. And I'm very HPE, I've got to say. I it's didn't mention Cisco oh, either. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, okay. I, and I'm with Cisco. Um, Although it is a good point that we're so, all very large companies. Before we actually get into the questions I'm going to be asking the panel, how many of you go to OpenStack meetups? Nice. Very impressive. Okay. Better than Austin, I think. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. you have to or because you want to? Because you run them like us? Oh, that was going to be my next, well, that okay. was going to be the next question. Are, are any of you actually meetup organizers? Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Where? A third of the crowd. What, what <laughs> location? Is that Martin? I just took over to Minnesota. Minnesota? Oh. Okay. Denver. Denver. Oh, also Denver. So as well as, okay. Oh, but you're the Denver proper, not the Denver by Fort Collins? No. I know you have like separated that out. Okay. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Dave, we're big fans of David as well. And, and, and you, of course. And, and you now by default. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I can guess, but tell everybody else. Uh, Cologne. Cologne. Yeah. Nice. Um, so, well, we're just going to dive right in, unless you have anything else you had. No, you no. you seem like you had something on the, on the tip of your tongue there. No, I just wanted to know where, where they were. I wanted to know if Where's anyone was from Europe, particularly, and I know Christian is, but I didn't know if anyone else runs. So you're, for, you're based out here, and do you run a meetup, or which meetup do you attend? Dublin. 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 Okay. Nice. My favorite city in the world. Nice. Yeah. Okay, cool. Fans. Anyone else from Europe? I mean, I know you're from Europe. Chris, you don't go to the meetups in France, in Grenoble? Uh, in Grenoble, yeah, we do. I just don't. Oh, okay. He's not the organizer. Okay. He's not the organizer. <laughs> he doesn't have to go, so he doesn't go. Okay. All right, cool. Thanks, everyone. So we've done this presentation, what, two or three times now. We've done it, we did it at the Austin Summit. We just did it a couple of months ago at OpenStack East in New York. And we keep seeming to fine tune it and see, keep seeming to get on this calendar for the conference track. So uh, we must be getting good feedback. So, but I'm just going to go jump right into the questions here. Um, and the first one I'm going to toss out to Ken, and that is, what, how does your group become a recognized meetup? Because there are certain benefits to that through the OpenStack Foundation. Yeah, so the, I know there were, that's three <laughs> organizers. Did you, did, you, did you know that there's such thing as an officially recognized OpenStack user group? By that, I, and by that, I don't mean necessarily that you're on meetup.com. Well, I know that we've had some conversations with foundations. So okay. I think you're the only one of the three, right? And, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's easy enough to do. He's going to tell you how. Yeah. Okay. So there is a, <laughs> there is a process in place. Um, so a recon an officially recognized user group just means that the foundation um, knows the work you're doing and that you meet some of the criteria that the foundation believes um, should be part of what a user group means in, the, in this community. That's simply things are like, um, are you, you know, is your group organized and run by a single company, or does it try to pull in other companies? Um, do you have some diversity in in um, uh, in that in the uh, community itself and in and the people organizing? Uh, do you talk about technologies that are relevant to OpenStack, or is it mainly vendor pitches? Uh, so things like you know, are you willing to uh, reach out to to social media to let people know about what you're doing. So there is a um, if you go to the OpenStack.org website under the community page, there is that uh, or community tab. There is a user group web page, and in there there's a link to something called the official user group process. And there's basically six things, only five. Well, five of the six things are that are required, definitely required. If you can check off those things. Um, and let your, your OpenStack ambassador know, you can basically be a, consider a recognized user group. Um, and uh, that, having that recognition means that, among other things, 
on the website, it would be an oversight website. It shows that you're a recognized user group, and you also get a special logo that's created particularly for your user group. Um, so just as a way to kind of show off and to let people know that you're officially recognized. So, um, and if you don't know who your OpenStack ambassador is, there should be at least. It's probably one. Ken. If you don't know who it is, it's probably <laughs> Ken. until yesterday. There should be so one, don't feel bad at if you don't. At least one in every country for every continent. Sorry, one or two for every continent. If you're in um, in the Americas, uh, or, um, basically or North America, basically Sean Roberts is the ambassador for all user groups west of the Mississippi, and I'm the ambassador for all user groups east of the Mississippi. But it doesn't extend all the way to Europe. Somebody else has that. I don't write to Sean because he'll send it to me. <laughs> um, um, and this is also inf information yeah. for all of you how you find your official user group. Because if you go to meetup.com, you might get some of the rogue meetup groups that aren't the official OpenStack <laughs> meetup group. Sometimes people fork a meetup, you know, we don't like it, but, um, but that's how you find your official meetup group near you as well, that same community yeah. tab you on the OpenStack. On the, map, find, or, yeah, the, yeah. the reason for that is um, what we found is um, while meetup.com, you're familiar with it, is very popular in North America, it is not necessarily um, popular or used by other countries. Um, and so in some, we've, in some places, actually Facebook, a Facebook page is the, is the preferred way to advertise their user group. So, we're at, so to try to um, kind of normalize that, um, we've created a user portal for every user, official user group. Uh, on the, off the OpenStack.org website. And that's part of the criteria for becoming an official user group. Um, you need to go in there and fill out some information about your group. So just because your information is in meetup.com or Facebook or on Facebook doesn't necessarily mean that same information in is on, uh, on OpenStack.org. Yeah. And we'll get into some of the benefits that that provides a couple of questions down. But while we're on the idea of meetups, Lisa, can you explain quickly the differences between user groups and meetups? Well, it, I mean, a, a or, meet or, or the blending, yeah, a meet of, the can blending be, of the right, terms. Exactly. It, yeah. it can be the same thing. It doesn't always happen. I, I'm a strong believer that we're building communities, and not every meetup or not every user group is a community. And so, um, you know, I, I will say that I lead the San Francisco Bay Area OpenStack community activities, which is our user group. But it's, um, you know, it, it's kind of two ways. I mean, there's a lot of communities that exist on IRC. Meetup.com has actually very specific rules that you, you have to meet in person. You can advertise online meetups. If you do too many of them, you'll get a note from them. I've had this note before because I like to also offer content to the whole world um, and do online meetups and, and you'll get a little note from the meetup.com people saying, you know, our whole idea is for people to be meeting in person. And, um, but there's reasons for that because when you're building communicate, communities, you need people to participate in communities and it's a two-way street. You know, you're not just taking, you're also giving back. Um, and so I encourage people to make sure that their, their user groups are also very active communities. And just does a great job with this too. She has a lot of social activities that, that are worked into to her meetup even more so than me. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of fun with it. And, and so it's, it's a network of people that's actually a community. Which actually segues really well into our next question, which is, I'm out of curiosity, how many of you work remotely? From an office, you, you Telecommute. You telecommute. Don't, yeah, you, you don't go into yeah, an office you and you don't sit go with into your an colleagues. Because one of the things that we talk about a lot at our meetups is sort of a remedy. Meetups can be a remedy for remote, what we call remote worker syndrome. Yeah. And it's a chance to re-engage with people. Um, you know, I know that I work probably nine out, if, in, in a given two weeks, I'm probably nine, to, nine out of ten days at home and my most meaningful conversations tend to take place with my dogs and you know you don't have that face to face contact yeah. but i'll let you you want to dive into that a little bit yeah so seattle that's a big thing uh, over where we live especially the traffic is terrible in seattle if anybody's been there or lived there um, and a lot of our employees and a lot of the employees in the tech community at large uh, do not commute to work they they work at home or they work at a starbucks or they work you know wherever they can find a place to to set up their laptop so i find when i first started hosting meetups i, I was new to the tech community and to the company which was formerly blue box before we were acquired by ibm 
And a lot of the people that would come to my meetups would say, this is the first human contact I've had in like six months, <laughs> you know, whatever. And so I, I thought that was really strange at first, but now I'm, I'm very used to these folks coming that, that really don't get out a whole lot on purpose. And that's just their lifestyle, but they love getting together with other members of their community because they talk to these people all the time, or they talk to people, you know, who are coding the same things and working on the same projects and, and working for, toward common goals. And they're out meeting people and learning about different companies because there's so many different companies represented that come to our meetups um, that if they're looking to change jobs or if they're looking to advance in their own company, they're, they're meeting people that they may not have otherwise met. So it's a very positive thing. Six months. The weather must be really bad in Seattle. <laughs> Worse than I thought. It can get uh, bad. Yeah. So another point of that is some of the activities that we do at the meetups, we, we change it up and not every meetup is the same. And sometimes, you know, we're throwing open stack a birthday party and sometimes we're diving really deep into, into content. And sometimes it's really technical and sometimes it's higher level open stack 101 kind of things. And sometimes we'll do, uh, Stefan created this upstream game made out of Legos. Um, and it was a game that, that actually teaches you how to be a very good community member and participate participate in OpenStack. Um, it, it was brilliant, actually, the way, I won't explain it to you because it would take forever, but, um, but that was one of the things we did in terms of community building, you know, teaching people how to be really good community members, specifically to OpenStack, because this was the OpenStack meetup. So you can do things like that. Yeah. So one of the things that's near and dear to my heart, and we're going to jump into one of the challenges that I think that every organizer runs into is how do you make these meetups happen from a financial standpoint? You know, I run OpenStack LA. I have never charged a member a penny to come to a meetup. I think that's probably true across Nor the board. I. So how, does it, how do you do that? How do you have food and drink and presenters and goodies and giveaways and basically put on these free events for people? Now, and I think each one of us probably works on a little bit of a different model. So I'm going to sort of go into what I do, and I'm going to let the rest of the panel sort of chime in on what they do. Um, I don't like to use the term pay to play, but that's sort of how I run my meetups as far as the sponsors coming in to give their content and give their presentations. And we're actually going to touch on content and another piece. But we've had some of the biggest companies in the OpenStack community come to our group, pre present, and the interesting thing, and I like to point this out to the organizers, is these resources are available. You just have to learn how to ask for them. Companies like HP, Rackspace, Mirantis, um, um, IBM. We've had IBM. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I wanted to say Blue Box, but I have, yeah. to, I have to be official now. Yeah. Um, they have community outreach people on their event teams that are solely responsible for facilitating things like meetups, providing presenters, providing the funding for pizza and beer for 50 people in your organization or in your group to come and meet at your facility. Um, so you just have to start, a, and look, when I took over the OpenStack LA group, I inherited a group from someone who had started it. I had no clue. And I think probably the hardest thing for me was learning to ask the question you almost feel like you're asking for a handout. But they, they will fly people out to your facility to give the presentation. They will pay for the food and the beer. They will bring boxes full of tchotchkes, uh, shirts, giveaways, stickers. Uh, the last time HP was at our meetup, they brought a laptop for a raffle prize. And you know it, the resources are there. You just have to do a little digging within each of the companies to find it. But you know, my goal is to always provide the meetups at you know zero dollars to my members. And I work almost identical model to Gary. Actually, um, the only thing I don't usually have to do is go out and find people because they approach me. I get I have a waiting list actually of people that want to host or co-sponsor the meetups, and so we provide the beverages, they provide the food and the speaker. And I used to do it that way, but it was always getting very expensive for us because I have no way of cross-charging someone for alcohol um, or for the facilities or security, late night, keeping the lights, all that stuff. So I could take someone's credit card for the pizza, but that was about it. Um, so now in the last year, so I did that for two years at, at HPE in Sunnyvale, and now for the last year I've actually encouraged companies to, I've moved it around, but in the 
not pay-to-play model, um, I, and in the interest of building communities, I make sure that if you want to host a meetup, that you are all, you are also sometimes hosting a meetup that you are not presenting at. Like, don't you're not just hosting and presenting your stuff. It's just too tempting to do a vendor pitch and bore everyone, and we lose our community. So, you know, I always ask, are you willing to host meetups that other people speak at? And, and it's because there's also a lot of, you know, we have community people like a, a PTL of, uh, you know, Magnum, Adrian Otto came and spoke at our, at our meetup, or Thingy, you know, Mike Prez, or Morgan, or that people will fly in, and Rob Hirschfield last week, right? So they, they are not with the company. I mean, it wasn't a Rackspace thing, it was an OpenStack Magnum thing. So those are the meetups that I want to have almost at least once a month, and then I'll do maybe a vendor-oriented meetup the other, the other week. I, we do our meetups twice a month. So, um, so that's what I want to know. Are, are you also willing to host a meetup that has nothing to do with your company or your technology in the interest of community building. And if they are, then um, okay, you can be on my list of potential sites that we'll move this around to. Um, so living in New York, probably similar to everyone else, don't really have a problem getting people to want to sponsor and speak. Um, I think the challenge is probably more if you're not living in a one of the hotbeds for technology or finance, how do you get people? Um, so I had that challenge with Philadelphia. Um, where, I mean, Philadelphia is not a small town, but it's not, it's, uh, it's not New York. So um, one of the things I've done is taking what I call a center city approach, which is the idea that um, for, and um, I think that translates to other countries too, uh, in most regions there is a place, a city, that's kind of like the, the bellwether city, the center city for that region. Uh, so typically what I'll do is, um, if, some, if a vendor is, wants to speak in New York, I tell them they also have to speak in Philadelphia. Um, and, or I offer them the opportunity to speak in Philadelphia. And what I find frequently... <laughs> the mandatory <laughs> opportunity. Yeah. And it works because um, it, since uh, even to this day, most of the folks, companies that have OpenStack um, speakers are flying them into New York, um, often from the West Coast. It's actually, in some ways, more economical for them if they can hit several user groups in the same week, yeah. rather than just fly in and fly out the same night. Um, so what I typically do is arrange to have uh, a meetup for New York on a Wednesday, and then the Philadelphia one on Thursday. And when we used to, when I used to help organize the Connecticut group, we also had it. We had the Connecticut group on Tuesday, and so we'd basically just kind of run the and uh, speakers through each of those uh, user groups and give them a chance to do, do the same talk if they want to. Um, and that gave them an opportunity, again, to kind of maximize um, the audience they have and also to be able to say, yeah, they've helped support uh, multiple user groups in a given week. We did a swap like that once, too, in uh, Portland and Seattle. We called each other as organizers and said, we just had a really great talk. And then he said, well, I just had a really great talk, too, and you want to trade. And so the following <laughs> month, they, the Portland speaker came to my uh, meetup, and, and then ours went down there. So. Yeah, actually, we should work out a Pacific yeah. Rim thing. Here. We should. <laughs> we really should. Yeah. It actually, that's how we helped kickstart the uh, the Northern Virginia group. They were um, uh, they were trying to find speakers, and basically, I had asked them to contact uh, the Washington D.C. group, and uh, they already had someone from Ranta scheduled to speak in Washington D.C. So they were they uh, that speak same was, was happy to go to the Northern Virginia group the next day to speak at their uh, first meetup. I move our meetups from San Jose to San Francisco, which with our traffic in the Bay Area is probably right. as yeah. far as Portland right. to Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll talk about LA later. Um, <laughs> I'm actually going to jump because you guys are bringing up a topic that is a little farther down in our, our question list, but it kind of segues nicely because we're talking about getting speakers in the door. What are some of the things, I mean, I know we're, I think all four of us are relatively fortunate now that we have highly recognizable groups and we have people essentially like you said waiting to knock on our door to you know try to get and present to the group when the group was young and you didn't have that sort of cachet what did what were some of the things and i think applying to a new group what do you do to find presenters what, what are some of the resources that you use to find presenters how do you entice them to come to the come and present at your meetup just ask. I mean, they'll come. No, seriously, <laughs> yeah. the open, the stackers will fly all over. I'm coming after you next. You're coming to the bay. I didn't literally. Yeah, I, just, I literally yeah. make a phone yeah. call, and yeah. I'm like, "Will you come?" Like Adrian lives by you, right. but I'm like, "Come talk at our meetup." 
project mountain hottest project of sec this is back in and March. i asked some of our engineers internally at my company because that's all i knew when i first started obviously um who they wanted to hear speak from other companies or from other places and they gave me some good ideas the other resource that i again point out to new groups or, or smaller groups that don't have that sort of waiting list of presenters is the OpenStack Foundation is just within what, about the last year created the Speakers Bureau. So there's actually a database of people who are willing to speak at groups. It'll tell you whether or not they're willing to travel, the things that they cover. So, you know, it's, that's part of the OpenStack org. Uh, I think it's actually in the community section or is it in, in the community user group section? Check out the Speaker Bureau and, you know, maybe start with people that are local to your group and you know try to minimize trap you know travel for them but that resource is available so it's a great way to sort of find it um and if you know there's a conference coming through your town grab right. those speakers mm -hmm. at you know during that week and, and try know, to schedule your right. meetup right around that conference that's we did yep. that last month with uh, mm -hmm. openstack seattle yeah so. and i and for my group i'm working with the guys that used to be metacloud that are now cisco um we use like the meetups that happen right before the summits for people who've had their talks accepted to do dry runs. I mean, it's a great way for them to like rehearse their presentation and get feedback from the crowd and what might make it better when they finally get to the summit. Um, speaking of meetups, that's why we're here. What are some of your best meetups? What, what made some of your meetups stand out? Uh, the, the one we did last Wednesday was like Rob Hirschfeld came in from Austin and talked about um, containers in OpenStack, which is an unbelievably hot topic. And we've done like five of our last six meetups on containers in OpenStack. But um, it usually was containers on OpenStack, and he talked about Kubernetes as the underlay, and it was packed. I mean, standing room only. It was, we had over 150 people there, and um, and. I've never had so many people come up to me before, during, after, you know, kind of just like, wow, this was an amazing meetup. Um, and so I thought about that. I'm like, well, what made it so amazing? Um, and, and we had more than one speaker. You know, I spoke and Rob spoke and uh, John Starmer spoke. Um, so we had kind of a variety of, of different levels of, of topic too, because um, Rob was way in the weeds. But I think the content, I mean, I'm a big, big, big on content. And so um, if you have really good content, it's going to make a really good meetup. And everybody loves a party of course, but um, I think we're talking about the actual meetups. Right. So um, to just keep that content really, really good and keep those speakers really good. If you don't know anything about the speaker, try to find them on YouTube and figure out, is this person a good presenter? Um, you know, and, and variety is always nice too. And you find someone in from Austin to talk about a topic you haven't talked about before, but that it just happens to be the hottest conversation of the summer makes for a really good meetup. So playing devil's advocate, our party, our fifth birthday party was the best meetup I've ever had. Uh, it does count because we did have a speaker and he did kind of a funny little take on, you know, what's OpenStack going to look like in the future and he, and he played like with a Back to the Future theme and I gave away little Doc Brown um, figurines under people's chairs and stuff. I mean, it was kind of silly, but the great thing about that party besides the taco bar, which was a big hit, was <laughs> the fact that when Jesse was done with his talk, people did kind of form into small little community groups, which is the point, and they talked about what they're going through and what projects they were working on and what they were having trouble with and what they needed help with. So it actually ended up being one of the most, per, like one of the most, I would say, um, beneficial working sessions that we've ever had as long as I've been the organizer, so. Sounds borderline <laughs> therapeutic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was really a great day. Open that. Yeah. So, so obviously there's several ways to define what's the best. Um, so if you want the most attendance, just put containers. That's true. Say, yeah. say Docker versus Kubernetes versus Mesos. <laughs> That'll probably get a lot of attendance. Uh, in terms of most engaging, it's probably any meetup we have with, uh, where an end user presents. So an end user's done the OpenStack deployment. I know those are, can be difficult, but uh, our last meetup, we had someone who used to work at TD Bank um, talk, in de talk about how they, how they deploy OpenStack. And he, w he was planning to give a 10 minute uh, presentation. Um, it ended up being a 10 minute presentation followed by a 30 minute Q&A. Yeah. Um, because users, pe people want to know how things are done in the real world. Uh, so my suggestion is, and sometimes it can be hard to get users to speak. Um, so the rules I kind of give them is you don't have to ever mention your company's name uh, or even what industry you are, although that's helpful. Uh, the other thing is I always offer to help them uh, with their presentation, if they're not um, a seasoned speaker. 
And the third thing I tell them is uh, keep it short as long as you're willing to take questions. Because that, that, that kind of presentation kind of um, almost makes itself just because of the experience that people want to hear about. Yeah, I know I've, I find that given the opportunity, the Q&A sessions will generally sometimes last much longer than the presentations themselves. I, I periodically have to go through and just you sweep people out the building at the end of the oh, evening. Yes. It's like, you don't have we to go home, but you can't stay here kind of a thing. The uh, alarm's going to go off in yeah. Seattle. That's what we tell them, which is true. Well, these, and remember, these meetups that we're organizing, that you guys are organizing, are like mini seminars. I mean, right. when Rob flew in, it was, it was like a little OpenStack Days Right. Sonyville. And people flew in for it as well when they saw the content. But we asked the question, you know, how many people are going to the summit? Because we don't usually even do a meetup a week before the summit because we're all going crazy with super busy. Um, but usually over the years, you know, there's been a fair amount of the room that is also going to the summit, particularly from the, from the Bay Area where I live. And this time, no one raised their hands. There was 150 people in the room. Not one person raised their hand except for Rob Hershfield and me. And we, we couldn't believe it. We're like, wow. But this is why we bring the meetups to you. And people are really valuing these meetups as a free, none of us charge, except for sometimes in New York, <laughs> <laughs> New Yorkers. Um, but this is a, a way to bring this amazing content to people who are getting their travel cut and who don't have the resources to travel as far. And and they really, really appreciate it, especially when you have great speakers. But again, it just brings the focus back to content and how important that is to the, to the meetups, which means I'm putting you on the spot now. Yep. Because <laughs> content's uh, kind of my thing. She's yeah. our content queen. Yes. So I, th some of the advice that you give to presenters on tailoring their content for the meetups. So the first few that I did um, early in my career at Blue Box, the, the content was a little clunky. The presentation wasn't a bad presentation in any way, shape, or form, but it wasn't organized for the type of audience that we have. Um, some of the slides weren't done. Some of one person didn't know how to get their slides on the computer. So now I just made it easier on myself, you know, a couple months in and said, I'm gonna make a cheat sheet for every speaker that we accept. And they have to send me their abstract of what they're going to talk about before I even announce it on the meetup site, just be, to make sure it's not a vendor pitch, because we have had that happen. And you get really awful feedback, and then your attendance drops the following month, and that's not a good thing for anyone. So um, I make sure that I look at their abstract beforehand, and then I also actually require them to send me their slides before they come to Seattle. Uh, just a, to make sure they're prepared. B, to make sure what I just said, they're not going to just talk about their company and talk about whatever product they're, they're selling. And then C, to make sure that there's like a coherent uh, way that they're going to be presenting this and it's not either too short or too long because we've had both, again, both problems in the past where somebody will prepare for something for 10 minutes and then there's two questions and we're just sitting there looking at each other with pizza and beer. Um, and then on the other hand, there's, there's a presentation, my longest one went an hour and 20 minutes and I was just sweating at the door like we are never going to get these people out of the building in time, I'm going to get in big trouble and yeah, anyway. Um, and then those types of presentations, people have 50 questions afterwards and you never want to cut people off because when they're engaged, that's the point, right? So I may be a little more pedantic than my colleagues up here about getting the content and organizing the content, but it's worked in my favor ever since. So I highly recommend some sort of cheat sheet or bullet pointed list to give out if you're an organizer, because it helps them too. I mean, it can be as simple as finding out what kind of laptop they're bringing and how is it going to connect to your AV system. We have our own laptop that we loaded on before they even get there. So that's, okay. that's see, the way see, I solve yeah, that see, problem. I, yeah, I, I, I know none of us can do that. That's the way I solve that problem. We work on Macs in Seattle, which a lot of people don't. So we have to make sure that that's taken care of before they get there. Yeah, I'll say that from an advertising standpoint, the, app, the title and the abstract is the most important thing. Yeah, yeah um, that's good. And it's... Um, I'm still surprised at how little thought, to be honest, sometimes some companies will, will put uh, into doing that. They'll, you know, they'll send something that says almost uh, nothing about what they're actually going to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, we don't modify. They, they wonder why I sometimes send it back and say, can you try it again? I'm glad I'm not the only one that sends some on that. Yeah. People's bios will be three times longer than their actual yeah. abstract. That's how that happens a lot. <laughs> like, no, I can't tell you how many abstracts I've rewritten. Uh, and again, I think that I think we've all experienced it at least once, and you'll sort of learn your lesson of I'm going to come and talk about X, and by the time they get there, they're talking about Y, and yeah. it's that's one of the things that we sort of try to deal with as far as content is concerned is that we want to make sure that we keep 
the content relevant and one of the things we don't want our presentations to turn into is a marketing brochure for the companies that are coming. I have no issues, and I know Lisa, you and I have talked about this too, about how much are you, do you let them actually talk about the company they're working for or, and, and that kind of a thing. But we really want the content to be relevant and we want it to be, you know, like you were saying, lessons learned or whatever the hot topic is, under the hood kind of deep dives. So. Um, and yeah. you do have the, the freedom to edit, like Ken was saying. Right. Yeah. You have to make it, a, you know, a, an abstract that people are going to want to come to see. So you, therefore, you have that editorial power to make grammatically fix everything and make it a good advertisement. Yeah. In general, my rule is um, if you come, you need to talk about um, a technology in a vendor-neutral yeah. way. But you're welcome to illustrate it. Uh, either by presentation or by demo using your company's technology. Sure, which sometimes they honestly can't avoid. Right, so a good example is when John came to speak in the East Coast, he talked about Cinder with OpenStack, uh, and then, but then he used Solidify as, the, mm -hmm. as an example of how to use Cinder. And, and I bet they brought socks, too. <laughs> <laughs> we always have great socks from Solidfire. Free socks, free angels. <laughs> free socks. <laughs> Yeah, I, for me, I don't have as much of a problem. I try to get more proactive rather than reactive. Like, I call people and pick who I want to see. I said, will you come and speak yeah. at our meetup? I, I do get vendors asking or people asking. Well, PTLs never beg to speak at my meetup. I'm usually yeah. begging them. But, um, but the, the vendors will. But for the most part, you know, you have control over what gets presented. It's your mm -hmm. user group that you're, that you're architecting. And so you want to make sure that you're giving them the best content. So reach out and you decide. And if, you know, the only reason I've had five of the last six conversations about containers is this this summer is because that's what everyone wants to talk about. Last summer it was networking, eight meetups right. in a row pretty yeah. much about networking yeah. and that was what was filling the room. So, right. you know, you gauge your audience and your, and your user community and then, you know, you throw in the, the vendors here and there if they really are truly doing something that would be useful for the community to learn about. Right. Knowing that we're running short on time, I want to bring a point back to Lisa and this is something that is huge for OpenStack and that's diversity. And what do you do to encourage diversity in the group? How do you foster it? How do you shepherd diversity within your group? Um, what are some of the things you've learned? Um, <laughs> this is obviously a whole session, and there have been <laughs> whole sessions about just that here. Um, and I think I just did a video blog about it from the Seattle user group, um, Seattle Days. So that's all out there on the Twitter sphere if you want to find it. But. Um, but in general, you, I mean, it's, it's great that Tasul and I are running, are running the West Coast um, so that you have women. <laughs> we forget about LA whenever possible. Um, but, you know, having women organizing and speaking at these user groups is huge for having women wanting to attend these user groups and, and participate. And, you know, you want to make sure that your, your presenters and the content that they're presenting reflects your community that you're trying to build and grow. So um, I don't tend to see people's slides ahead of time like Tasula, but I do encourage people to have slides that you know, have references that that are going to be relevant to the people in the audience, and you know, not just all stale, male and pale. I've seen way too much of that from you know our company, guilty as well. So uh, make sure that you know if you're giving references or examples, um, you know, if you have a younger audience, learn something about what they're into, like gaming or I, I know something cool. That I'd have to research that because <laughs> I'm not cool, but um, you know, whatever the whatever the young kids are into, or you know cultural references, obviously if you're presenting in another country, figure out what is cool in that country. Um, little details that maybe only you and I think about, like the food. The food, the food's a big the one food, in Seattle. Gluten-free You don't food, have gluten-free and veggie food, you're in trouble yeah, in the Northwest. Yeah, I have to have veggie all the time. The temperature of the room, it's always freezing. This whole conference is freezing. This, this conference, conference is freezing. I'm just like, freezing. clearly some man set the thermostat because you see all the women <laughs> running around like with five layers on, right? So we're always freezing. Like, can we just turn the temperature up a little. You know, things like that. Just think about things that maybe don't only include one group. Have you seen the trend change? Like, if you looked at your group mm. a Absolutely. couple of years, See, couple I, years I, ago versus I honestly, what? I've only had two female speakers in my entire reign there, and it's the same woman that's come twice. But uh, what so, about the actual members no, the group. of your group? Yeah, what no, about the membership? People will email me yeah. and go, are you going to be there tonight? Because right. if you're going to be there, I'll go. 
Yeah. And then when you see them there, meet them, introduce them yep. to other people in the community, yeah. do a little kind of mini mentoring, figure out what OpenStack project they're into, maybe introduce right. them to the PTL or other members of that project, get mm -hmm. them involved, make that connection. Because if you make that connection, they will continue to come and contribute and stay. You want them to stay. That's the yeah. big thing. So we're sort of in between party planner and mm -hmm. it's easy you know a little got a little tinder thing going on here. well no, <laughs> well, no. Let's not go so can, no just <laughs> connecting <laughs> people with the right people not this is not swipe i'm left, telling you man right. la this is what happens in la see that's right yeah so los you angeles know there is no tindering in seattle like no, in no, yeah. san francisco yeah. no but i mean as far as like you said connecting people with the right people in the group okay. getting them getting them hooked up with the right people as far as being a mentor and oh things like gosh. that do you even have tinder in europe it's like is it? Is it global? <laughs> okay, <laughs> All their faces went up. Like, <laughs> like what's that? Um, no one's going to admit it. Never heard of that. Nope. Um, well, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so um, I think maybe you open up a little Q&A. Sure. Um, what was the question it, we were supposed to make sure we saved time for? Oh, there was, there was one. Oh, you know what? There is one I want to do. Um, and this sort of goes back to content. And, you know, right now I think everybody knows that, you know, when, when we first started taking over meetups, I know mine was about two and a half years ago. I, I forget how long each one of you have been doing this. Almost two. You know, the, the goal at, for OpenStack yeah, was to great. have the technology, you know, grow. Grow the community, grow mm -hmm. OpenStack. Now it's turned into, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but it's, be, it's a business. People are trying to derive revenue from Open, OpenStack and it's not so much about the technology anymore, but it's, I think it's more about OpenStack as a product. So how do meetups fit into that? Do we stay, as we talked a couple of days ago, sort of true to our roots as far as the content of the meetups being very technical, like I was saying earlier, deep dives, under the hood kind of talks. Hackathons. Hackathons. Do those almost monthly. Or do we start, you know, do they evolve as, as OpenStack has, and do we start now sort of allowing that sort of vendor pitch to come into the presentations, to come into the content, because ultimately the, you know, I think for all of us, the end game is to be able to turn this into a sustainable business. And what is, what role do meetups play in that? So how much time? That you is got? a really good question. And I'd actually love to know as the people that attend meetups, you know, what you guys think. If you start going and seeing the vendors doing that, because yeah, if no one sells OpenStack, then OpenStack is probably not going to survive. So we do have a responsibility, all of us in this room, to help help OpenStack survive. And so, you know, is the meetup the forum for that? Or is the meetup the forum where we're, you know, still educating people about OpenStack, bringing the, that OpenStack content? Um, I guess my answer is it's, it's probably about balance. Like somewhere in between. I think it's a little bit somewhere in between. I think if you don't, I, I think if you just did vendor pitches all the time, I don't, I think you would lose your audience. What I would say though is if you're going to do a vendor pitch or if you got, just be super honest about it in your abstract. Make sure that it's really clear that people know what they're going to come and see because if people come and then all of a sudden they get blindsided or surprised by that, I, I think you're going to lose your group. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> I don't have anything to add on, on top yeah, of that because we uh, have more vendors than than others presenting as it is, and we're we're doing fine. Yeah. So, um, so I, like I said, I I try to tell them try to keep the technology, but you can use your solution as a way to demonstrate how that technology sure. can, can be practically used. Um, kind of aside, um, one of the things I've tried doing um, is um, in the East Coast. Um, Startups don't get as much love as they do on the Bay Area. Um, so one of the things I like to do is try to help uh, startups get some voice That's in great. New York. And usually in New York, unless there's a, unless there's a well-known company like an HP, IBM, or Red Hat, um, people don't turn out because uh, they don't know who a Plum Grid is or, or Metacore. So mm -hmm. one of the things I've tried doing fairly successfully is I try to pair up an established vendor with a new vendor. Okay. Um, in the same meetup. Um, so it eats into a little bit of the time they have, but it kind of gives uh, an opportunity for, um, for the new vendor to actually get an audience yeah. um, and to be able to get a hearing that they otherwise wouldn't. So that's a way, to me, that's a way of trying to grow the, the OpenStack ecosystem. I think, I think it's interesting that you say that, Doug, because I think some of the best turnouts that I've had for my groups have been when Mitakura 
or yeah, so we had a very or, big or Avi, or Avi Networks <laughs> comes in and yeah. gives a yeah. presentation they because because coast, you become so. the, the audience becomes a little hungry for knowledge for yeah. what they, for yeah. what they've got. Yep. No, absolutely. The one thing I will say about protecting your, your user community from, from the vendor spam is because so, uh, we have almost 6,000 members in the SF Bay Area OpenStack community, and not all of them are in the Bay Area. So our, um, because we do a lot of uh, the online, we do Hangouts. We, we record every single meetup. The content is up there. Um, and we also try to live stream it if we can so that people from all over the world can connect. And if we don't do that, I'm getting pinged. Like, where's the feed? Where's the live stream? <laughs> um, so because of that 6,000 user group number, vendors just go crazy and want me to email things out to the 6,000 people. And I get a lot of requests. To, oh, will you send this out? Will you send this out? I am extremely picky about what I send out to those 6,000 members. Um, I promise I will never spam anyone. I will only send it out if I really think it's relevant and will be useful to, to the community. So watch those as your communities grow and as the number grows. Because there's companies that just scan through Meetup and they just look at the size of Meetups. And then they just, you know, and they try to push things out themselves. Mm -hmm. So make sure you have all those locks on your Meetup meetup.com page yeah. that you own mm -hmm. that don't let people just spam your spam group. Spam your group. Yeah, because yeah. that's when I hear about it. I don't hear about it as much if we had the off, off you know, vendor pitch live. A couple of people will maybe say something, but I hear about it if the email goes out like that. Okay, well I, now I know we're over time, but I will say, I will ask if there are any questions. We'll, we're happy to address those. There we go. Do you need him to do this on a microphone? Are you recording? Oh, you, here. No, we I'll do it. Talk? We'll do this. We, we, could, we could repeat his question, too. That would be easy. Yeah. <laughs> so biggest challenge we have in Denver is we have a, a, a three co-leaders, all of whom have heavy travel schedules. And so the organizational aspect of that actually becomes a huge challenge. And then getting someone, all three of us are from different vendors, um, but uh, getting somebody who is more on the user operator side to be willing to step up as an as a organizer is actually really, really challenging. Mm -hmm. And so it's extraordinarily difficult for us because we'll be like, hey, Shannon, you're going to be in town? No. Nah. Hey, Pete, are you going to be around? No. Well, I got to be gone too. So what do we do? You, we can feel your I, pain. I Welcome just to had this. World. I just had this happen last month. But Gary, take it. And then I, well, if I'll tell you right now, say, I am, and this is something that I'm addressing as we speak, bringing on a co-organizer for me, because I am a solo organizer for OpenStack LA, and it is a burden. I mean, not in a terrible way, but right now, it's the fourth Thursday of the month. My group should be meeting tonight. But I'm here talking about the importance of meetup. So there's a, <laughs> there's a certain irony in that, and that actually happened, right. that's actually happened a couple of times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so my, you know, so I feel your pain, I'm, you know, Actually, I think one of the criteria for becoming an actual recognized meetup group is you can't be a solo organizer. And is that still the case? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so feel free to jump in on. I have co-organizers in theory, in name, and yeah. one of them does do the Seattle OpenStack Day, which is separate completely from my meetups. But he was he also travels. He probably travels more than I do. And so this happened to me last month. I had to go to Texas to do something for work, and I was already, I already had scheduled the meetup. The vendor was coming. They had already bought their plane tickets. It's not going to go away. And my marketing folks that usually help me that perfectly know how to run it were either with me on my trip or elsewhere on a trip. So I panicked and freaked out and you know called in as many favors as I could call in. I ended up getting one of our OpenStack engineers to actually host it, um, bribing with Target gift cards and <laughs> promises of beer forever and all that good stuff. But he was lovely about it, and, and he obviously knows the community better than I do in, in many ways and was able to handle it. But that said, he didn't know the logistical side of it, even though he's been to probably five or six of my meetups. He had no idea that I had to unlock the elevators and call for the food and, uh, you know, all these things that have to happen with the speaker. There's a lot of moving parts that people don't realize go into meetups. There's 15 or 16 steps to every meetup that I take. So I wrote everything out for him. And it was actually a good exercise for me if that ever happens again, because now I have this cheat sheet that I can just hand to someone and make it happen. So it, it went off without a hitch, thank God. But I worried all night. I didn't sleep. I don't think he slept because I kept stressing him out. So yeah, so, um, difficult contingency. Sorry. No, it's okay. So I mentioned I'm a, I'm a co-organizer of a couple of groups. Um, so that's actually flowed out that center city model. 
of getting speakers. What I did was I basically made a deal with a couple of people. Who, uh, so each of the cities uh, where I'm a co-organizer, there is an on-site, like a person who lives in that area who doesn't travel all the time. Who, and basically the way we divided was uh, those people, that person or those people are responsible for on-site logistics, making sure food and drinks. So they interface with the vendor who's sponsoring to get credit cards because they know where to go. And my responsibility mainly focused on advertising and getting the speakers. Um, so in That's that good. way, uh, not only do I get someone involved who's, who's there locally and yeah. knows the area and can be there, um, but often a lot, of, uh, especially if it is that you're trying to get an end user to be a co-organizer, yep. they don't know who to go to to get speakers. So I would leave that some of that responsibility yeah. so they can just focus on making sure the uh, the actual meetup happens. And my challenge with the co-organizer, um, had he been in town, I still couldn't have passed it completely to him because for our company, we have to have somebody from our company in the building for insurance reasons. So even though he would have been probably happy to host, he couldn't have locked the elevators and all that. But I think, and specifically, the specific question you asked, because you're saying you're having trouble getting someone to co. So I've yeah. been running the meetup for three years. I used to have two co-organizers. They, for the better part of the last three years, they have been absolutely absent. And I've done it pretty much by myself. And it's, it is so much work. This is probably the time where we can start talking about burnout, right? Yeah, yeah that's we, our next talk. whole session on burnout. In it's Boston, we come to our burnout talk. It's a ridiculous amount of work. Um, and it's, it's a thankless job. No one really understands how much work it is or things you we all have day jobs which also bleed into the night right so then this is another job um, and so what I did in the last couple of particularly the last year is I started moving the meetup around because when we do two a month so it's just an unbelievable amount of time it's yeah. insane don't feel like you have to do two a month but <laughs> there's so much content to get out there and so many people want to speak and so many people that I want them to speak and so you know I want to do that it's one of the reasons it's such a th thriving community but if I know I'm going to be out of town especially I make sure that you know that might be when I let a vendor speak and present on their things if they will host it at their site and manage everything and do yeah. all the logistics and because I'll tell them I'm not even going to show up. I'm like, what? You're not going to be <laughs> You're there? You're just outsourcing that? it. That's yeah, you basically exactly. are. So for the meetups that you have no one, just give them to someone else. Have, you know, have CA hosted or one of the big companies in De HP, one of the big companies in Denver. Yeah. Um, and they will they love doing that. Yeah. They really love doing that because it's your community you're bringing to them. Yeah. And people like road trips. Do you host it at the same place every single time? We do yeah. too because yeah. it helps. That gives them a sense of regularity. Exactly. Well, that's what, that's I, what I was about that. to say. I think I that cadence that is very important, and I, and I feel your pain because I've yeah. actually had far fewer meetups this year than I had hoped to have simply because, again, as a solo organizer and struggling to find a partner. Um, you do sort of, you miss that, and then I get emails from the group, what happened, why haven't we met for the last couple of months, and I said, you know, my dog has spent more time in the kennel than he has at home with me, <laughs> so, you know, I bar sorry about the meetup, but we'll get back on track, and that's why I'm starting in January, we're bringing on a co-organizer. He's also part of our, my organization to address the issues that Tasula and Lisa have about being able to get in the facility, getting, being able to take care of the locks and the elevators and security issues and all that kind of stuff. So, but it's good to have the consistency of when you're building your community. Yeah. What I, it was a risk. I didn't know if people would travel around and it turns out they will you know Walmart hosted one of our meetups and it was one of the most popular meetups again back to the, having the end user speaking it was packed and you know IBM we've done a few there and we've so the the community will go I mean again people don't love change but they actually they like the variety I'm like are you getting tired of beer and pizza because they it, might give you tacos it also it also you know matters how easy your place is to get to our place is downtown in a location that's very near to our bus system in Seattle so they don't have to drive if they do drive there are a lot of parking options nearby um, we did have one meetup that was across the water um, in Bellevue and that was very poorly attended so we didn't do that again we did try it and it failed so we just didn't do it again but, but okay. that's just Seattle that's unique to us I think the so AV guys the AV guys are putting on their home. jackets and they're, they're picking <laughs> yes. up their bags and going home. Go home so um, obviously you know how to reach any of us via yeah, our Twitter our handles, Twitter handles um, are on if you have questions and you know need advice anything feel free to reach out to us uh, thanks for coming and staying so late on the last day of the summit. We really appreciate it. I uh, thank you to my fellow yeah. panelists. Yeah. And uh, give yourselves a hand. Everyone you, it's get your home community. Safely. You built right. it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right.